the Joe Rogan experience. Um, but to share that with everybody nationally in my world in the Thin Green Line, and for them to start having it happening on the refuges, and even just to know this stuff's getting back to their parts of the world and poisoning their, their cannabis users, you know, unsuspectingly. Horrible information, right? But we need to know it. And a lot of guys didn't know it. And so that was one thing to see, hey, we need to have a baseline training. And the way we do it here in California is we all go through a really stringent academy. Everyone gets their basic tools, arrest control and defensive tactics, you know, and firearms training and all of that and get good at being the traditional game warden and doing all the traditional stuff. And they get, you know, get, get their feet wet out doing their own thing for a couple of years. And then we start to find the people that have the motivation or want to get onto a specialized unit like our MET team or one of the watershed teams or the wildlife trafficking team, very seldomly do we put a fresh person there because, you know, I think to really be a good game warden, you got to cut your teeth on all the traditional stuff that's critical of just having to, having to check guys with guns all the time. You know, most cops look at that and go, that's crazy. I mean, everybody you check has a knife or a firearm. Yeah. Well, fortunately, 99% of them are guys like you and me that want to see a game warden and the game warden wants to see us. But for that one felon that's on parole and he's in the woods hiding out and we run across that a lot. And I, I ran across a ton of that down here in SoCal really? at the start of my career. And I've got some interesting stories about that. But So guys um, who are like, they skip bail and then they go and hide? Yep. And they've got like a no bail warrant. They're wanted on some warrant somewhere. And so they're off fishing, they have an illegal firearm, maybe they're a felon in possession of a firearm they can't even have. And now they're out in a remote area where no cop's going to find me here. And then I'm the new game warden in Riverside County, you know, all freaking motivated, really green. I don't know right. totally what I'm doing yet. Right. And I'm in that truck cruising and something I got into down here that was just crazy. But I will say this, it was a heck of a learning curve. And I'm, I'm really blessed it went out the way it did and it was, I was safe in it. But um, we would get gangbangers from, from L.A. here. And they would go over into Riverside County and get into my kind of rural, you know, foothills and on the edge of the National Forest. And they'd have AK-47s and they'd have, you know, automatic pistols. And they would spotlight through these canyons, gunning for everything. They'd kill rabbits, they'd kill coyotes, they'd kill deer. They'd get to the end of like a canyon that has like a, an outlet of a dam, throw a gill net out and spend all night there just gill net and fish and hunting freely and shooting, killing everything with their spotlights, grab their gill net, grab hundreds of fish, pack up, and then head back, you know, back to the L.A. Basin. Gangbangers? I'm not kidding. And the craziest part- Fishing gangbangers? Yeah. Like commercial, almost commercial fishing? Does it? Does it, it sounds nuts, so right? So strange. And what would they do with the fish? Oh, they'd eat them. Maybe they'd sell them. You know, who knows? Usually with quantities that big, they were getting sold. But the thing that was crazy is I would be, you know, alone. I'd be in my truck. I didn't have a canine yet, you know, and now I just, uh, I just retired with, well, like you're a marshal. I have Apollo, yellow lab, English lab. She's amazing. Never going to bite a bad guy, but she's going to lick him to death and try to, try to, you know, uh, turn him our way. Um, but I didn't even have a companion dog at the time and I would go and run into these guys and go, okay, this is what I learned in the academy that, you know, that, that head on spotlighting stop that you never want to have or getting behind them blacked out and tracking them down. Um, and next thing I know I got AKs and I got all these freaking prohibited exotic weapons and I'm going, this is crazy. I'm pulling these guys out alone. I don't have a lot so of backup. So it was just you. It was just me. How many guys did you run into? Sometimes it'd be two. One night I pulled like eight people out of a van. Oh, shit. And I was alone. Oh, shit. And they were all armed, and it was one of my heaviest, most intense cases, and I had been on one year. So this was 1994. And what we were doing in the Riverside Squad is we were just saturating the area because we were getting everybody from over on the L.A. side here, spotlighting all our games. So we're like, okay, let's saturate this. And back then, Joe, the game was to catch a spotlighter red-handed because they're so deliberate. Explain spotlight to a lot oh, of yeah, people yeah. listening to this. Yeah, I, pre- yeah, I should have I done that. But spotlighting is where you use an artificial light, whether it's a handheld spotlight, a flashlight, whatever, and you go into remote areas and you look to find animals at night because they freeze, they're really relaxed, their eyes glow, and then you shoot them that way. You kill them illegally at night after dark, which is never allowed. You know, It's usually in or out of hunting season because anyone's going to spotlight a deer nine times out of ten. They're, they're not licensed or they're not going to do it during season like we do um so they're doing that so in the in our world as game wardens that's the ultimate wildlife criminal because they're going to kill does you know that that have that unborn trophy buck for good genetics they're going to kill a trophy deer way in the rut you know that you know needs to go another year or whatever um so that's what we focused on that was like if i can cut my teeth and get you know become a a a reputable game warden of going after the hardcores that was the game then so it was 94 
And I'm pulling these guys out and calling them out on the loudspeaker. I've got my weapon on them. And I'm like, oh, man, there's a lot of guys out there. I can't get them to jail. I'm calling back up. I got Riverside County coming in. I mean, we even had the, the, the sheriff's office helicopter come in several nights. Once we got to know each other and they realized, who is this game warden? And what are these game wardens of Riverside County going out into just crazy areas by themselves? They'd monitor our traffic and they'd come in on the helicopter and light it up and call them, you know, call these bad guys out on loudspeakers just to make sure we were okay. And it feels good when the cavalry comes on those nights, man, let me tell you. Well, it's so in crazy. those sort of situations, they just didn't know that you would ever run into someone that's that armed, that many guys yeah. in a van or what have you, eight people. Right. It, it's a, so the, the reason why you're patrolling by yourself is because they didn't anticipate anything like this well and we didn't have the bodies right this was oh, one of the things okay. that was crazy we get back to the thin green line concept and realize that one game warden is responsible for 200 to 250 square miles give or take whoa and you know how big riverside county is on the inland 200 Empire. square miles maybe more you know depending on what part one of the state game you're warden? In. one game warden so a squad of seven game wardens to put it in perspective check this out brother so when I was supervising traditional patrol before we started the special ops met team in Santa Clara County, we always had vacancies because we were always low on bodies. We couldn't hire game wardens fast enough. Or we weren't funded for it or where the case may be. So we might have four or five game wardens for seven positions. And we had to cover all of Santa Clara County, which is everything from the city to all those foothills. And there's a lot of it in Silicon Valley. People don't realize all of San Benito County, which is huge. Hollister, Gilroy, right where I'm from in Gilroy, that whole area down to the south, that is just massive mountain country, full of wildlife. Um, and then like part of Monterey County. And I had five people and myself as a lieutenant. That is insane. I can't and believe that. So to go out on a spotlighting patrol to that point um, and have a partner with you, just one other game warden, that's tough. You know, you're basically pulling a whole other area. You can't work night hunters. So is spotlighting that common? It is. It is still going on in the state and it's going on a lot um, back then here because there had been so little presence here in Southern California. It was off the hook. It was crazy. One week in 1994, I remember I was, uh, I had a really good ride along with me, a wildlife biologist, such as a savvy hunter, great eyes. He became kind of like my right hand man, Brian. Um, and we, I said, we're going to catch a spotlighter every night this week. He goes, you think so? I go, it's that crazy. Let's see if we can do it. And so we went and worked all night long. We started on Monday night. How do you catch them? Do you look for a spotlight? Like, what, do you get to yeah, a vantage point and you, glass? It, it's, yeah, it's just like glass in a big basin for elk, right? right. You, you, you get in a really good overwatch that so you get the most visibility, you know, hide the truck. And um, you watch and you find areas where it's likely to happen. And it, it takes a while to learn where that's going to be just because you got this huge district and you could have 20 places where guys spotlight. But until you get into the area as a new warden and really get to figure it all out, you don't know where to be, and it's a trial and error. But, you know, it took me six months, give or take, of just, just going out there and scouting hard and, and seeing where this road goes and how does that canyon look? What type of water do I have down there? What am I seeing at low light in the evening when animals are coming to water? Ooh, I got a whole herd of elk here. I got a whole herd of deer. I got some bucks. You know, I'm seeing other animals run around. This is going to be a hot spot because guys can get to it. And if you just put the time in, you just kind of lie in wait, you know, kind of put your little hide together, um, just like hunting a uh, big game. Eventually it starts happening. And by 1994, and I've been in district a year down here, I pretty much had my spots figured out. My partners in other parts of Riverside did too. So we'd all be out alone so we could cover more area and talking back and forth. I mean, and I'm going to date myself here, but cell phones are brand new. So we all had those flip cell phones. and we were, How old are you? Uh, I'm going to be 51 in November. I'm 52. Yeah. Just don't worry are, about it. No, no. Yeah. <laughs> so we're right there, you know, all that era. So when I started, I mean, it was the flip phone, you know, the Star mm -hmm. Trek communicator. Sure. Call my partner, Jerry, like, I love those. where are you at? They're great. Yeah. I'm like, where are you at? He goes, I'm over here in Thomas Mountain. I'm like, I'm over here. You see anything yet? I go, I got one light working. Uh, all right. I got to go. And then I'll go. So, here. But that's crazy. Like you're talking about enormous pieces yeah. of land oh, it's that huge. you guys are responsible yeah. for. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for, it's hard for people to put into perspective that don't spend any time in the woods right. that you would be able to even find these folks in this enormous area. Yeah, yeah. It starts off as a needle in a haystack type thing, you know, but once you get into it, you get fairly good at it. But it, it always is difficult because, again, just the percentages of catching a guy on the right night that he's going to be out there. And then you got the guys that kind of get savvy to knowing where the game warden lives driving by his house, looking for his patrol truck to see if he's out that night. Where's the truck parked? We start oh, getting into that wow. problem. So 
we always kind of, you know, kind of maintain as covert as we can. You know, we're known in the neighborhood. And the thing is, we live at home. We work out of our homes, home office. We're close to our community because if we kept our truck at a field office, we'd have no response time all spread out. So we get very community oriented in, in community functions and conservation groups. And everybody knows us, whether it's a big city or a small little town in the mountains. So you got guys doing the cat and mouse thing, looking for us and, you know, making sure, Hey, is this truck there? Or is he out patrolling? Well, maybe I won't go out tonight. Mm. Um, but, but that, that era, Joe in, in 1994 was, was off the hook. I, I didn't get a spotlighter every night that week, but I got six out of seven and one wow. night I had a double. So it was crazy Wow. and seizing a ton of guns. And, you know, some guys were going to jail, some weren't. Um, but a lot of wildlife was saved that night because they would have, they would would have done a lot of harm. You now, know, most of these guys, are they doing this recreationally for fun? Are they doing it for food? Like what are they the, the group I was getting into down here, it was, it was recreational. It might have been to sell the meat. I couldn't prove that, or it was just to go kill stuff. Um, you do get people that need meat, you know, that do spotlight after dark because they need the meat and stuff like that. And mm-hmm. it's still a violation. We still deal with it as such. But if we ascertain that, we're going to be fair about it. You know, we said, okay, look, you're poaching. I know you're starving. It's out of season. It's in season. You have a tag, but you just really got to get that meat. I mean, there are certain cases where you just kind of feel for that person and go, I see where the motivation was, you know, and a very small percentage of poachers are that way, but some of them are just, you know, they're just trying to feed their family right? and they're, it's a whole different game and we're yeah. going to be fair about it or we should be fair about but it. But most of them gangbangers or most of them criminals? Like what is it? Was there a down a, here average down here? 70, 80%. Yeah. Had criminal histories, had illegal weapons associated with gangs. So um, it was almost like recreation for them. So it almost that was. was like what practice. Yeah. 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 And I remember one case down here that was a, pretty crazy one it was it was three guys pretty inebriated pretty liquored up and um it was a head-on stop and one of them had a uh like a fifty thousand dollar no bail warrant for cocaine trafficking out of mexico and that was in that week that we had you know crazy spotlight and things going on so it was just the demographic of down here where up north it it wouldn't it wouldn't be necessarily that felon but that guy that just wanted that trophy buck and to get it cheat to get 